During the next half an hour, we are going to be discussing William Shakespeare's well-known comedy, A Midsummer Night's Dream. As you know, William Shakespeare was an Elizabethan poet and playwright. That is, he lived uh, during the time of the Tudor monarch, uh, Elizabeth I. He is widely considered the greatest dramatist in English. Uh, speaking on the fecundity of Shakespeare's imagination, uh, the French writer Alexander Dumas said, after God, Shakespeare has created most. Uh, before we proceed to the details of the play, let us learn about the dramatist. William Shakespeare was born in 1564 at Stratford-upon-Avon in England as a son of John Shakespeare and Mary Arden. John Shakespeare was an alderman and glover and, his mo and Shakespeare's mother, Mary Arden, belonged to a wealthy landowning family. Probably Shakespeare was educated in a grammar school whose curriculum consisted of Latin grammar and classics. His contemporary Ben Johnson has written that Shakespeare knew small gr Latin and less Greek. At the age of 18, Shakespeare married Anne Hathaway, who was eight years his senior. And with Anne, Shakespeare had three children, uh, a daughter by name Susanna, and twins Hamnet and Judith. Sometime after 1585, Shakespeare left for London, the capital city of England. In London, he began his career as an actor, writer, and part owner of a drama company called Lord Chamberlain's Men, which later became The King's Men. Shakespeare started writing plays in the traditional style, adapting traditional plots and stock dramatic devices. But later he came to be known for his insightful originality, particularly in the creation of characters. Uh, he even aroused the envy of his uh, contemporaries, such as Robert Greene. Um, Shakespeare's plays were staged uh, at three different theatres, the Theatre, the Curtain and the Globe. He lived in London for about three decades. After that, probably he retired to his hometown, Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, he died on the 23rd of April, 1616. In 1623, that is seven years after Shakespeare's death, John Heminge and Henry Condell, two of Shakespeare's friends, uh, published a volume called The First Folio. It was a collection of his plays and poems. Shakespeare's surviving work consists of 38 plays. Uh, with, this also includes collaborations. Uh, in addition to these 38 plays, uh, the folio also contains 154 sonnets, two long narrative poems, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece, and several other poems also. Shakespeare is widely studied, interpreted, and his plays are widely performed. Uh, his plays are performed more than the works of any other playwright. Uh, the plays are cla usually classified into tragedies, comedies, and historical plays. Some scholars also add the categories chronicle plays, Roman plays, problem plays, and dramatic romances. Shakespeare's comedies fall into what are called the early and mature phases of his career. The mature comedies include As You Like It and Twelfth Night. A Midsummer Night's Dream is uh, counted among Shakespeare's early comedies. It is considered lighter in tone and more playful in comparison with the mature comedies. A Midsummer Night's Dream seems to have been written sometime be between 1590 and 1596. How do you date a Shakespeare play? It is impossible to determine the exact date of writing or of production. Of course, his plays came out in print much later. In order to arrive at a probable date, uh, scholars rely on both external and internal evidence. For example, A Midsummer Night's Dream is listed in Francis Mayer's Palladistamia, uh, which came out in 1598. It is a critical account of poems and plays. This is typical of external evidence. 
As for internal evidence, that is evidence within the play for the data production, it is said that Titania's account of the disastrous effect on the weather of her quarrel with Oberon is a reference to the bad summer of 1594 in England. Similarly, you have a play within the play called The Lamentable Comedy and Most Cruel Death of Pyramus and Thisbe. What is the plot of the play? The plot of the play is basically the story of Romeo and Juliet, which was written sometime between 1591 and 1595. As I said already, A Midsummer Night's Dream is an early comedy. It is said that uh, this is a play in which lyrical moods and feelings take precedence over careful character study. However, this does not mean that it is an immature play. It is Shakespeare's first successful experiment in the domain of comedy after rather conventional comedies such as A Comedy of Errors, The Two Gentlemen of Verona and Love's Slavery is Lost. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare shows a command over characterization. He also shows great power in creating a romantic atmosphere. As the title suggests, A Midsummer Night's Dream has a dreamy atmosphere. It is about the fantastic adventures of a knight. The fairies add the fantastic element to the play. We also find in the play a great command on the part of Shakespeare in unifying the stories of people belonging to different worlds and different stations of life. Fairy kings and queens, human lovers and the Athenian mechanics. Shakespeare's craftsmanship is so powerful that Bottom is transported to the land of fairies as easily as fairies come down to the world of human beings. Of course, there are incongruities, anachronisms, impossible juxtapositions and other difficulties. But Shakespeare reduces them all to harmony. Love, art, magic, dream, play and even low Comic scenes are interwoven by Shakespeare's fertile imagination. We will discuss A Midsummer Night's Dream as a romantic comedy later. But before that, let us look at the plot and characters of the play. The plot of a play is enacted by its characters. The characters of a dramatic work are called Dramatis Personae. The Dramatis Personae of A Midsummer Night's Dream may be classified into three groups. The first group includes Theseus, the Duke of Athens, Hippolyta, the Queen of the Amazons, who is the betrothed of Theseus, Hermia, a young Athenian woman who is in love with Lysander, Lysander, a young Athenian man, who is in love with Hermia and Helena at different times of the play, Aegeus, father of Hermia, who wants Hermia to marry Demetrius, Helena, who is in love with Demetrius, Demetrius, who is in love with Hermia and Helena at different times of the play, Philostrate, master of the revels for Theseus. The second group of characters is supernatural. This group includes Oberon, king of the fairies, Titania, queen of the fairies, Puck, also called Robin Goodfellow, who is servant to Oberon, and Titania's fairy servants, Peace Blossom, Cobweb, Moth, and Mustard Seed. The third group consists of an amateur acting troupe. These actors are Peter Quince, a carpenter and the leader of the troupe, Nick Bottom, a weaver. In the course of the play, Bottom is transformed into a donkey. He plays the role of Pyramus in the troupe's production of Pyramus and Thisbe. Francis Flute, the bellows mender who plays Thisbe in the play. Robin Stavling, the tailor who plays a moonshine. Tom Snout, the tinker who plays a wall. Snug, the joiner who plays the lion. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, it is character 
more than incident which makes the drama lively. This is the case with most of Shakespeare's comedies. In fact, Bottom, the weaver in A Whitsamanite's Dream, is one of the first really great comic characters on the English stage. Now let us turn our attention to the plot of the play. A Midsummer Night's Dream features three interlocking plots which are organized into five acts. These acts are further divided into one or two scenes. In the first plot, preparations are being made for the wedding of Duke Theseus to Hippolyta. Hippolyta is the queen of the Amazons. The Amazons are a nation of female warriors uh, who have been conquered by Theseus. In the opening scene, Aegeus, an Athenian citizen, enters the court of Duke Theseus and lodges a complaint against his daughter. Aegeus wants his daughter Hermia to marry Demetrius, to whom she has been betrothed. But Hermia is in love with Lysander and refuses to obey her father's command to marry Demetrius. Then Aegeus requests the Duke of Athens to enforce an ancient Athenian law whereby a daughter must marry the suitor selected by her father or else face death. Theseus offers Hermia another option. This is to lead a life of seclusion in a nunnery worshipping Diana, the Greek goddess of chastity. Meanwhile, Hermia and Lysander decide to elope from Athens to the place of Lysander's aunt, where the Athenian laws are not valid, where they can be safely married. Hermia confides this to her bosom friend, Helena. And Helena shares this information with Demetrius. Demetrius had earlier sought and won Helena's love, but now he spurns her and wants to marry Hermia. Around the same time, a group of rustic laborers or rude mechanicals as they are called, uh, agree to rehearse an act which they call the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. They want to perform this act on the occasion of Duke Theseus's wedding. Peter Quince, the leader of the group, reads out the names of characters and assigns the roles to his fellow players. The role of Pyramus is assigned to a stage-struck weaver by name Bottom. But he is over-enthusiastic and wants to play almost every other character in the play. They agree to meet at Duke's Oak, which are part of a forest outside the city of Athens. This is also the haunt of fairies. A lot of comedy in the play results from the overlap of these two worlds. Meanwhile, Oberon and Titania the king and the queen of the fairies have arrived in the wood. They will remain in the wood till they have attended Theseus' and Hippolyta's wedding. Oberon and Hippolyta are estranged. This is because Titania refuses to give her husband an Indian changeling whom he wants as his knight or henchman. Titania refuses to part with the boy because his mother was one of her worshippers. Oberon wants to punish Titania for her defiance. He calls his mischievous court jester by name Puck and asks him to smear Titania's eyelids with the magical juice of a flower called love in idleness. When the magical juice is applied to a person's eyelids, it makes the victim fall in love with the first living creature he or she sees upon waking up. Oberon's intent is to make Titania fall in love with an animal of the forest or something like that so that her fascination for the changeling is removed and she concedes his request. Oberon sees Demetrius behave cruelly towards Helena. Taking pity upon the girl, he asks Puck to apply some of the magical juice on Demetrius's eyelids. When Lysander wakes up from his sleep, he sees Helena and is in love with her. The consequences are hilarious. Having been spurned for so long, 
Helena can't believe that two men are in love with her. On the other hand, Hermia does not understand why her formerly committed lover, Lysander, has left her. She accuses Helena of having stolen Lysander away from her. Four lo lovers quarrel with each other. Lysander and Demetrius are so enraged that they seek a place for duel to prove whose love for Helena is greater. But now Oberon orders Puck to lead Demetrius and Lysander away from each other. They fall asleep and Oberon asks uh, Puck to remove the charm from Lysander's eyes so that he is in love with Hermia again. Meanwhile, the six laborers are near Titania's bar rehearsing the play. Puck spots Bottom and fastens an ass's head on his neck. When he returns for the next lines, his friends run away screaming in terror. His singing wakes up Titania, who is under the impact of the magical juice, immediately falls in love with the Bottom. She lavishes her fond attention on Bottom. She also asks her fairy servants to serve Bottom. This newfound fascination for Bottom counteracts Titania's attachment to the changeling. While she is in this state of devotion, Oberon takes the changeling away from her. Having achieved his purpose, Oberon asks Puck to release Titania. He also orders Puck to remove the ass's head from Bottom's neck. In the morning, Theseus and Hippolyta arrive on the scene as part of a hunt. They see the lovers there. The lovers cannot understand what has happened to them during the course of the last night. They try to explain it away as part of a dream. Now Theseus finds that the love problem does not exist anymore. Since Demetrius does not love Hermia anymore, Theseus orders for a group wedding overruling Aegeus' objections. Now the lovers get married, Hermia to Lysander and Helena to Demetrius. After all these people exit, Bottom also wakes up. He cannot understand the happenings either. The only thing he can say is that he has had a dream past the wit of man. In Athens, Theseus, Hippolyta and the lovers watch the play staged by Bottom and his men. The play is a tragedy. It's about the tragic death of the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe. But it is so badly performed that the audience laugh as if it were meant to be a comedy. When the newly wed couples retire to bed, Puck blesses her marriage bed and blesses a house with good fortune and good progeny. He also tells the audience that it was merely a dream. Remember that the play is called A Midsummer Night's Dream. Let us now attempt a genric analysis of the play. As I said earlier, A Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy. The English word comedy is derived from two Greek words, komos meaning revel and eidos meaning singer. So komodia in Greek is a comic song. A comedy always features light-hearted actions and amusing incidents. Although the plot is complicated, it does not end in a catastrophe, unlike in a tragedy. Uh, it always ends in resolution, uh, in a promise of life to continue. Since the time of the ancient Greeks, there have been two streams or two types of comedy. The first is the satirical comedy. A satirical comedy pours ridicule upon human foibles and vices. It follows contempt with chastisement. It has a strictly moral purpose. But Shakespeare wrote a second type of comedy, which is the romantic comedy. Love is a ruling force in a comedy. Love is a passion which uh, takes hold of the senses, the brain and heart. People fall in love, they pass through a lot of sufferings, obstacles and confusions. But finally they overcome these obstacles 
uh, get married and live a happy life thereafter. We know that uh, Mitzumarayan's dream also ends in multiple weddings. Hermia and Lysander, Helena and Demetrius, Theseus and Hippolyta all get married at the end of the play. Another feature of Shakespeare's romantic comedies is that they are full of strange, unfamiliar and remote situations and incidents. In A Mitzumarayan's Dream, it is the presence of the fairies, the intervention of Oberon and Puck's mischief which contribute to the fantastic element in the play. The scene of a romantic comedy is away from everyday life. In A Mitzumarayan's Dream, the action occurs in a forest on the outskirts of Athens. It is a fairy world which adds this fantastic element. This does not mean that the play is cut off from real life. There are realistic checks on the happiness of lovers. We can say that in Shakespeare's romantic comedies, the supernatural and the natural commingle. There is also a blend of realistic and fantastic elements. An important characteristic of Shakespeare's romantic comedies is their merry atmosphere. Like the other romantic comedies, A Midsummer Night's Dream exposes ordinary life to the light of imagination and poetry. The floodgates of laughter burst on the spectator's mind with a cleansing and purifying effect. The pervading tone is one of genial humour. Unlike his contemporary Ben Johnson, Shakespeare does not ridicule human vices or defects. People who belong to different stations of life and who possess different worth make their appearance in the play. But each of them receives sympathy from the readers. As I said, sympathy and tolerance are the guiding principles of Shakespeare's romantic world. The last characteristic of Shakespeare's comedies is the liveliness of the women characters. Women constitute the soul of Shakespeare's romantic comedies. We have Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing, Viola in Twelfth Night, and Rosalind in As You Like It. But we must remember that A Midsummer Night's Dream is one of Shakespeare's early comedies. So A Midsummer Night's Dream is an exception to this rule. Hermia and Helena are no match for Viola and Rosalind. They have no initiative in the relationship with men. They are merely the changing objects of their men's affections. Let us now explore the major themes of the play A Midsummer Night's Dream. We'll discuss the most important theme in the play, difficulties in love. We saw that love is the pivot around which Shakespeare's romantic comedies revolve. How is the theme of love treated in the comedies? Faced with obstacles in his relationship with uh, Hermia, Lysander says the course of true love never did run smooth. When he says that, he is articulating one of the major themes of the play, namely difficulties and challenges in love. But these troubles are made the focus of fun. The tone of the play is so light-hearted that the audience has no doubts that the play will end happily. A resolution is anticipated also in the introduction of the supernatural characters, the benevolent fairies. We should also note that the tragedy of the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, is also performed in a light-hearted and comic manner. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, we also find several imbalances and incongruities in love. Hermia loves Lysander. Lysander loves Hermia. Helena loves Demetrius. But Demetrius does not love Helena. He loves Hermia instead. But the most hilarious aspect of love in the play is the beautiful Titania's love for the grotesque, clumsy and ass-headed bottom. But these incongruities and imbalances prevail in the play only for a short while. They are transient. Uh, the plot of the play makes sure that the lovers are properly matched and symmetry is achieved. It is a fact that A Midsummer Night's Dream is a play which ends in multiple weddings.
The second major theme in the play is magic or magic and the supernatural. The fairy world is a central element in the play. It is the fairy's magic which contributes to the element of the fantastic in the play. The fairies are also responsible for bringing about many bizarre and hilarious situations in the play. But we must also remember that it is the fairy's magic which leads to the resolution of several tensions at the beginning of the play. In the case of Helena and Demetrius, the effect of the magical juice lasts beyond the specific hours of supernatural intervention. Does this juice symbolize anything? On the one hand, Shakespeare is suggesting the almost supernatural character of love. On the other hand, if one may give a more earthly explanation, uh, Shakespeare is hinting at uh, the capricious nature of love which can change its object at the mere application of a liquid. Here in the play, the lovers change their affections and they claim that they are under the influence of reason while they are in fact charmed and a fairy queen can woo a beast. As the title of the play suggests, dreams are a theme in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Almost all the characters talk about dreaming. Hippolyta's first words in the play are as follows. She says, four nights will quickly dream away the time. What do the characters mean when they talk about dreams? After all the magic in the woods, the lovers cannot understand what has happened to them. They use the word to explain away the bizarre happenings of the previous night. Bottom cannot understand the happenings either. He says that he has had a dream past the wit of man. What do you make out of these statements? Here, the characters use the word dream as a metaphor for inexplicability. At the end of the play, we find Puck saying that what the audience saw was a dream. He says that, if they have offended anyone, they should forget it as a mere dream. What does Puck mean by this? A dream is illusory in character like dramatic art. And in that sense, dream is also a metaphor for art. Puck's statement also hints that a playful comedy like a Midsummer Night's dream should be taken only lightly. It should not be taken as heavy drama. At least this is the sense in which the lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe is performed and received by the audience. We will conclude discussing the issues of gender and class in the play. During Shakespeare's time, despite the fact that England was ruled by a queen, ordinary women had very less freedom and very few opportunities. Therefore, it is not surprising that male dominance is a major theme in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Theseus weds Hippolyta. Let us remember that Hippolyta was a queen of a nation of female warriors. She was conquered by Theseus. This represents the replacement of a regime of female autonomy with male hegemony. Patriarchal hegemony is also evident in the plight of the lovers. The law of the land has given legitimacy to this patriarchal hegemony. The Athenian law allows parents the disposal of their daughters in marriage or permission to put them to death in the case of disobedience. So Hermia and Lysander have no choice but to escape into the woods. Even the happy ending of multiple weddings is ideologically dubious. Marriage is presented as the ultimate social achievement for women, while men can pursue a variety of activities and can gain societal recognition. We all laugh at the performance of Bottom and his men. In the play also, the elite audience has a condescending attitude towards the performance. 
but there are ideological issues here. This attitude shows the wide disparity in cultural and social opportunities in England. You know, the social and cultural opportunities were severely constrained that it was nearly impossible for a person like Bottom, that is somebody belonging to his class, to write or stage a play. 